Freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Good evening, everybody. Greetings and salutations. My name is Kevin Brown. I am a member of the Inglewood Rotary Club and a member of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Champions of Peace Committee. The other committee members are Sharon Smith, Yasmin Parvey, Donovan Rodriguez, the chairperson Charlotte Bennett Schoen, and District Governor John G. Susani. I wanna thank you for attending this Zoom meeting and welcome to the District 7490's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day program. We're here to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. King. Our theme tonight corresponds to the 2022 theme of the King Center. It starts with me, shifting priorities to create the beloved community. Tonight, we will view selections from some of Dr. King's most influential speeches. We will also have some of our community leaders share a few of their impressions of Dr. King. We're also blessed to have performances by the Passaic County Technical Institute Vocal Technique Ensemble, as well as Ms. Rosie Grant, a member of the Rotary Club of Patterson. Finally, we are happy to say that the Reverend Sunita Ponton, a Metro Community Center, has agreed to share with us some of her thoughts on this day and its meaning. As well as the celebration of Dr. King, we are launching the 2022 Champions of Peace program. The purpose of this program is to encourage the pursuit of peace by giving recognition 
to those who are creating the beloved community by their own efforts. We're asking that each Rotary Club nominate two individuals in their community for recognition as exemplars of community activists for peace. These champions of peace will then be recognized during our program on May 9th. There's gonna be some time in the program for questions and answers. So if you do have some questions, just write them down or hold them in your head, and then you'll be able to uh, ask them at the appropriate period. And now I'd like to introduce District Governor John Susani. John G. G. Susani was born and raised in Patterson. He attended JFK High School, where he developed lifelong friendships that endure to this day. He's a current resident of Totowin, New Jersey, and became a member of Patterson Rotary Club number 70 in 2003. There he served as president from 2016 to 2017. District Governor Susani was also vice president of the Patterson Task Force from 2014 to 2016, and served on the board of directors for 10 years. Together, Rotary, excuse me, together Patterson Rotary and Patterson Task Force have worked to help the citizens of Patterson in many ways. As a member of the New Jersey Supreme Court's District Ethics Committee, Governor Susani helped oversee the public practice of attorneys in the areas of accountability, legal competency, and ethical conduct while serving a three-year term. And as an attorney, I'm happy to say I've never been in front of him. John has served as a board member of the Olympian Charity Society in Passaic County and has been a member of the men's club for 50 years. That's commitment and service. After attending college in Connecticut, he entered the real estate industry to help families achieve the American dream of home ownership. This has resulted in a 40 year plus career as a real estate professional with most of those years as broker owner of Caldwell Banker, Susani Realty in Patterson. District Governor Susani is also a Paul Harris Fellow and major donor. He's been honored as the Walter D. Head Award recipient twice. He's also served on many of the Patterson Rotary Club committees. The son of an immigrant who loved this country, John proudly served for six years during the Vietnam War as a medic in the U.S. Army Reserve. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor John G. Susani. Thank you, Kevin. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for attending this event this evening in honor of our hero, Dr. Martin Luther King. One of his favorite sayings was life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? As wrote, as Rotarians, we practice this saying every day because Rotarians live by a four-way test. We're, we always ask, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it bring and build goodwill and better friendships? Will it benefit all in all concerned? We know and we've lived through, most of us have lived through, the fact that Dr. Martin Luther King's movement in the 1950s and early 60s, which was the beginning of the nonviolent movement for the achievement of equality for African-Americans in the USA. Martin Luther King used the power of love and nonviolence to organize and achieve his goals of equality. We all remember where we were when he was taken from us. And we hope and pray that his work will be remembered for generations to come. Thank you for attending this, this program this evening. And I now turn it over to Charlotte Bennett Schoen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome once again, please mute uh, yourself. Uh, if you look to the left, lower left-hand side of the screen, you will see 
a mute button. Uh, click on it and mute yourself. Thank you very much. Yes, we shall. Today, as we celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., let us take a moment to reflect on Dr. King's life and message. As we revisit King's celebrated I Have a Dream speech delivered on, on August 28, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. <laughs>
We have with us tonight the Passaic County Technical Institute Vocal Technique Ensemble. They're gonna give us a presentation. It's called Steal Away. When we were putting this program together, we reviewed the video that they sent us. And I just wanna say that uh, it's like the voices of angels. It shows you what can happen when you take a group of young people, give them the right direction, the right encouragement and training and how you can mold them and have them come out to be like diamonds, showing what talents they have to the world. On the direction of Jose F. Martinez, a 2009 graduate of the Rosa L. Parks School of Fine and Performing Arts, we're proud to present the Passaic County Technical Institute Vocal Technique Ensemble, PCTI for short. I never would have named it that, but it's PCTI for short. The PCTI school family, excuse me, the PCTI school family proudly shares that they have had two performing art majors as finalists on NBC's The Voice. Ms. Way McDonald in 2016 and Ms. Haley Mia in 2021. Performing Still Away, we present the PCTI Vocal Technique Ensemble.
But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hoped that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. (laughs) 
They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. As I was stating, the purpose of Champions of Peace program is to recognize those in our communities who are working towards the realization of Dr. King's dreams. The struggle does continue. I mean, as we saw those clips from the past couple of summers, there's still a whole lot of work to be done. But the good thing is that even though Dr. King is no longer with us in the flesh, he's here in the spirit. And that spirit continues. And so we're asking that the Rotary Clubs, as I stated before, find two people that they believe are worthy of recognition. Because part of the work of realizing Dr. King's dreams is giving recognition to those, the foot soldiers, who are making things happen. Um, it, the ceremony will be held on May 9th on the Cannot Be Rotary Club members. Thank you. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. 
I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrims pride ladies and gentlemen uh good evening once again my name is donovan rodriguez uh i now introduce um tom monroe uh, he's historian and a legend in his own time if you run into anyone in Inglewood and ask if they have ever heard of him, they would respond by saying, you mean Moose? A coach of boys basketball and football and girls track and a teacher at the Janice Dismas uh, Middle School and the Dwight Murray High School for over 31 years. Tom has maintained a passion for history and especially that of his community and its African-American roots. He is regarded as a treasure trove of information and inspiration. From 1962 to 1963, I was at Norfolk State College in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, when we come home from um, the summer, most of the college kids and some of the high school kids were given jobs doing the, the boycott and, and the desegregation of the schools. And the two schools were Lincoln School and Cleveland School. Cleveland School, which is now named, for, is really something. A Cleveland School was 100% uh, white and 100% white teachers. Now, even though we were 99% at Lincoln School, black students, there was 99%, I would say 90, in elementary, it was 98% white teachers. Um, a lot of people didn't know that Lincoln School went from kindergarten to ninth grade because we had a junior high part of Lincoln School on the William Street and Inglewood Avenue side. So the, the Lincoln School junior high was 99% white. 
black students, but it was 99% white teachers. So getting back to 1962 and 1963, a lot of the parents took their kids out of the school in the protest of the desegregation of Lincoln School and Cleveland School. And they set up, a lot of the parents set up uh, where the kids could get a little education, but they marched and boycott. And at that time, TNEC was doing the same thing. And TNEC happened to desegregate the Bryan School about a couple of months before Inglewood. So I'm home from um, the summer break, and we had big rallies in McKay Park. So most of the teenagers and the, and the college students would be like guides and passing out pamphlets and things. And we were surprised because, well, I wasn't really surprised because Dr. Leroy McLeod, he wasn't Dr. McLeod then, he was the only black teacher in the junior high school and in elementary school we had three black teachers. Miss Gray, um, Mrs. Fowler, you might have heard of her, and um, who was the other one? I can't. Oh, Miss Jackson, who became Mrs. Benz when she worked at Lincoln School. And um, during the rallies, um, they took all the kids out and they marched and boycott. I got signs on my phone and pictures of them boycotting with the kids and. Uh, having school for the kids. And this kept going on. But Dr. McLeod invited some people to come over. And when he invited Rosa Parks, we already went crazy. Mm -hmm. But then he invited Adam Clayton Powell, who's Big Wheel in New York, Senator Adam Clayton Powell, who I got a picture of a thousand people out in McKay Park during the rally. The two churches, power churches in Englewood back then was Galilee, where Reverend Taylor, who became our only black mayor, he was in charge of, and Isaiah Goodman at First Baptist, my church. These two ministers were really spearheading the boycotts with, I guess, Charlotte, you know, the great Baron Bear, right? Mm -hmm. And his wife. And they were involved in helping desegregate the school. Matter of fact, they were arrested many times. And I have a picture of our mothers leaving the old um, city hall and police station that used to be over there on Palisade Avenue. They were arrested for trying to uh, register their kids at Cleveland School. But we had the rallies and went through a lot of things. And I remember um, in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, that would, um, first started the desegregation of Lincoln School because Lincoln Junior High School, which I was a part of, was um, cut out in 1955-56. And I was in the eighth grade, so I didn't get a chance to have a prom, uh, a graduation like most of the kids who graduated from Lincoln Junior High School. The other junior high school was Ingle Street, which is the building right next to the right. library. But you were right in the middle of all the history, Tom. Yes, Do you yes. know who it was who actually invited Dr. Martin Luther King to come to Englewood? Dr. Right. McLeod, he, he was the spearhead of inviting all. You know, Dr. McLeod was the second black teacher in 1942 in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Norris was the first, but he was killed in World War II. And then Dr. McLeod became the first and only black teacher. And, and now he, his name is on the school. Yes, the school that was desegregated, that was all white. That is That's really awesome. something. We also have with us tonight the Reverend Alan Boyer. The Reverend Alan Boyer served for 16 years as pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Patterson, New Jersey. Born in Washington and Warren County, he graduated from the Essex County Community College with a degree in accounting. 
He then received a bachelor's in business administration from Bloomfield College, and then earned his Master of Divinity from New Brunswick Theological Seminary. He's currently working on his doctorate in ministry at the Newburgh Theological Seminary. As a pastor at Bethel, Reverend Boyer emphasized making the fourth ward a safe place for the youth. His efforts include securing funding to turn a vacant lot near the church into a playground, as well as creating the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park across the street from his church. On March 27th, 1968, days before his assassination, Dr. King spoke at the church, which was then known as the Community Baptist Church of Love. Here to share his reflections of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is Reverend Alan Boyer. Good evening. Um, although I never met Dr. King personally, I did have an occasion to get a glimpse of him when he was coming down the steps from Abyssinia Baptist Church in Newark. And also I was at the funeral services uh, down in Georgia with the, out on the street with the rest of the crowd as the, um, the carriage, the horse driven carriage was coming by. And um, in 2005, I was awestruck when I was appointed to the pastor of the last church building that he spoke in before his assassination. And when I sat in the very chair in which he sat on my first Sunday there, I realized that I had to change my whole paradigm and mission. It, it, it had to change. The Reverend Martin Dr. Luther King's greatness was anchored in his service, in, his, in, in the desire of his to serve. It was rooted in obedience to his call and guided by his strength to love, to love and to love. Today we celebrate Dr. King's personal sacrifice and we uh, commit ourselves to his vision for a peaceful world founded on the powerful principles of love, nonviolence, economic and social justice for the entire human family. Uh, Dr. King's faith enabled him to overcome valleys experiences while maintaining mountaintop hopes. And likewise for myself as pastor of the church that he visited and left an indelible mark upon, sitting in that chair Sunday after Sunday, I realized my work was to transform the lives of those in my community and renew their minds so that their faith would lead them through the desolate times to heights higher than the reach of despair, defeat, and unbelief. My prayer today in this, in this present day is that the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will infuse us with courage, discipline, discipline us with restraint and discipline us with hope for the future. We like Dr. King in this year of 2022 and decades to come, we must act with boldness to work with humility, knowing that it is the power of the grace of God that directs our paths and provide us to our victories. In January, Martin Luther King Day of 2018, I preached a sermon entitled, If You Want to Be Great, Be a Servant. My introduction was, in this present day society, there are people who have obtained higher degrees of education that believe themselves to be far more superior than others. Such were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who Jesus said, set in Moses' seat. Martin Luther King is best remembered for his position of social justice and nonviolent civil disobedience. He entered the world stage with a determination to demolish social injustice and build bridges of community and peace. During my pastor at Bethel AME, we engaged ourselves in several community programs to bring about peace and prosperity to our parish. As president of the ceasefire group of Patterson, we established gun buyback programs in cooperation with the Passaic County Sheriff's Department. We held annual basketball tournaments in the month of June, which brought the gang members together to compete in sport instead of violence. 
Dr. King, in his efforts to bring his ideals to fruition, he encouraged and espoused a life dedicated to the service of others. And I likewise strive to do the same. Dr. King learned from the life of the great preacher from Nazareth, whose mandate to his followers was that they must serve. Jesus said, if you want to be great, be a servant. And I've always considered myself to be a servant leader. Thank you for your attention. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the crevaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. The Reverend Sunita Pontan is a proud graduate of the Inglewood Public School District. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University. She then applied and was accepted into Harvard University School of Law, where she graduated with her Juris Doctor degree. Upon receiving the calling, she then attended Duke University School of Divinity where she graduated with her master's in divinity. Heeding the call of her faith, Reverend Ponton served in ministry in Houston, Texas, Durham, North Carolina, and even as far away as Kenya, Africa. For six years, she faithfully served in her home church, First Baptist Church of Inglewood, first as an associate and then as assistant pastor. She then decided to continue her ministry with Metro Community Center. While doing all this, somehow she found the time to work with Legal Outreach, a law-related college prep program in New York City, including most recently as her managing director of academic programs. Metro Community Center serves the Inglewood and surrounding communities. It partners with various organizations and agencies in the Bergen County area to meet the needs of and foster the many strengths of our local communities. The, service in, the services include the Metro Life Project. The program focuses on reducing at-risk tendencies in youth. The acronym LIFE, LIFE, encourages the individual to live in freedom every day. The goal is to remind program participants to take ownership of their lives and make strategic, healthy decisions that will set them up for future success. After her remarks, if anyone has any questions for the Reverend, we shall entertain them then. We're happy and blessed to present the Reverend Sunita Pontan, JD, Masters in Divinity. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you all this evening. I feel so honored to share with you all, and 
Um, I wish we could do Q&A in the other direction because I would love to hear some of your experiences. Um, I just want to share um, briefly just some thoughts um, on, um, on this Martin Luther King Day and um, particularly on the, the theme, it starts with me shifting priorities to become the beloved community. So I'm so happy that uh, Martin Luther King is a federal holiday and that so many organizations and churches and synagogues and schools and others take the time to honor the sacrifice and the legacy of Dr. King. In doing so today, I want to make sure that we do justice to the entirety of Dr. King's message. We love to remember King for his nonviolent protests and his eloquent speeches, but I charge all of us to consider the fullness of who he was. He was a black man. He was a Christian preacher. And I like to say that he was a Baptist preacher because he was, and he was a pastor. He was a husband and a father, along with being the most notable figure of this nation's civil rights movement. His commitments to love and nonviolence were rooted in his Christian faith. And they were influenced by the likes of, of Reverend Howard Thurman, but then also Mahatma Gandhi and Rabbi Abraham Heschel, just to name a few. And what he lived for and ultimately died for was a radical reordering of society as we know it. It was more than just little black boys and little black girls holding hands with little white boys and little white girls. King was committed to creating the beloved community. For King, the beloved community was both aspirational and yet obtainable. The beloved community was a community of true justice. It was more than racial integration. It includes economic freedom. It was about dignity and purpose and personhood. It was about the American ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness available to all, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status and without external interference. We often forget that King died in Memphis supporting the labor rights of sanitation workers. He believed that people should receive a living wage for their work. As he traveled the country, he became more convinced over time that this country's sins or evils were rooted as much in economic injustice as they were in racial injustice. He began to see the need to combat this country's issue of poverty in a coordinated and integrated way. And in fact, many forget that the March on Washington, and we just heard um, his speech, his I Have a Dream speech, was actually entitled The March for Jobs and Freedom. Many scholars believe that it was his increasing emphasis on economic justice, the creation of an integrated poor people's campaign and his outspokenness against the Vietnam War that ultimately led to his death. What King proposed and what he fought for was not nice or pretty. That's what made him dangerous. He had power and influence and an ear to the people. And he imagined a world where oppressive systems crumbled and all were invited to flourish. Our Jewish brothers and sisters might call this shalom. It's a holistic peace. But too often we have sanitized King. We imagine this soft, gushy love instead of the radical transformative love that endures dogs and fire hoses and bombings to call the country to its moral compass. We speak of a harmless dreaming King instead of one who was considered so dangerous to the social fabric of our country that he was surveilled by the federal government. And we've co-opted his message for our personal gain or worse, for street cred. Politicians in Florida have recently quoted King to further their efforts to erase and whitewash history rather than teach its children about the history of racism in this country. How dare someone quote King? a man who lost his life in the fight against racism to argue not to teach about racism. As we speak on this MLK day, Republican legislators, and I'm not trying to be political, I'm just stating the facts, are actively seeking ways to suppress the right to vote for American citizens. You do not understand King if you simultaneously hail King as a national icon and suppress voting rights at the same time. Similarly, you don't understand King if you celebrate him one Monday of the year and return to life as normal the remaining 364, 365 days of the year. What do I mean? King was assassinated for what he believed in, 
He was killed because he was an agitator. He was demonized because he called America to account for their sins, their hypocrisy and the evils they perpetuated against their own people and around the world. King was hated and he was feared. He was the subject of FBI investigations and personally despised by J. Edgar Hoover. He had bombs thrown at his home. He lived under the cloud of death daily. According to autopsy reports upon his death, this 39-year-old man had the heart of a 60-year-old. No doubt it was the result of stress borne not only from the weight of leading a movement, but also the stress of what that movement fought against, racial hatred and injustice. Just living was killing him. America killed King, and we have the audacity to now celebrate him. But we need to do it differently. We can do better. I hope that as we celebrate MLK Day this year, we actually commit to the realization of the beloved community. It was disheartening to hear that many of the statements made by King in 1963 about the condition of African Americans could be made today. Sadly, some of them are still true today. Therefore, King's legacy demands that we not only celebrate his life or quote his speeches, but that we live and strive toward that beloved community. It demands that we become peacemakers. It means that we move beyond complacency to seek justice for all who are oppressed. My fear, and, and I'm just speaking of my generation and even lower, is that we've become a people who mean well, but nevertheless remain actively complacent. We actively choose not to engage in the hard work of peacemaking. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, King identified three types of complacent people. And for our purposes, I'm only gonna highlight one, the moderate. This is the person who sees the problem, but is quote, more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. This person just wants everyone to sit down, to be quiet, and to wait. But passive aggression is not peace. Ignoring issues is not peace. Refusing to call out evil or injustice is not peace. Acting as if the harm did not occur is not peace. Wrongly, the moderate believes that she or he can set the timetable for another person's freedom. And it is based, whether consciously or not, on their own level of comfort. This is the type of person who will go with the flow and will expect change to happen on its own. But as King has said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through continuous struggle. And as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Those looking to take steps towards realizing the beloved community must be a peacemaker. And to be clear, peacemakers are different from peacetakers and peacekeepers. Peacetakers are those who don't want anyone to enjoy peace. Those are the ones who steal peace. Then there are the peacekeepers who are often confused as peacemakers, but peacekeepers will embrace a negative or a false peace avoiding issues or situations that could result in conflict. But peacemakers understand that conflict already exists. Injustice is already present. And the only way to get to true peace is by going through the pain of unearthing the truth and demanding accountability and reconciliation through love. Another way you might describe peacemakers is courageous agitators. This is what made MLK a peacemaker. Marches, sit-ins, boycotts, speeches, jail time were all peacemaking methods, courageous agitations, unearthing the truth and demanding accountability and reconciliation through love. They were seen as combative and violent, but only to those who benefited from the status quo, either out of power or of comfort. Yet without his tactics, I would still be sitting on the back of the bus. Change happened because someone dared to be a peacemaker. And change will only come again when someone else, or preferably someone's else, becomes peacemakers as well. We must become comfortable with discomfort, 
comfortable challenging the status quo and comfortable stirring the pot so that we can make the beloved community a reality. This may look like having difficult conversations with family members, friends, or coworkers about their racist, their sexist, their homophobic, or their class-based views. This may mean naming white supremacy and white privilege without caveats or watering down our language. This may look like reaching out to friends and family who live in states like Georgia and Arizona and Texas and persuading them to demand that their legislators stop any action to suppress the vote. This may look like demanding that our federal representatives take decisive action to protect voting rights today. This may look like looking around at the school children in Inglewood and demanding that each child be provided a quality education exhibited by increased test scores and college admissions. This may look like pressing in on our city government officials to create a strategic plan to assess the needs of and care for those who are still either living in hotels or facing other challenges following Hurricane Ida. Your family members might become upset with you. Your neighbors may turn their heads when they see you coming, but to sit idly by while others suffer makes a mockery of Dr. King and this time that we've spent together this evening. Many people that I know wonder what they would have done if they had been alive or of age in the 1950s or 60s or if they had lived in the South. They wonder what they would, have, what they would do differently from before. They wonder what they can do now. And I am so very honored to be on this Zoom call with you to see so many of you who participated in this civil rights movement in any way. But Martin Luther King is no longer alive, but we are. We don't have to wonder what we would do because our time and our season, our opportunity to create the beloved community is now. Will you commit to taking the first step toward the realization of the beloved community by becoming a peacemaker in the vein of the one we salute today, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Scott Redden. Hi, Sunita. I'm not taking questions from you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I want your opinion on something. Um, should we try to agitate, change, whatever? The people can be changed. I just feel like there's a certain percentage of people, no matter what, uh, not only are not going to agree with you, but um, fight back as long as they can, of course, because it's not in their best interest to change themselves. So at what point or who do we go to first? Or do we try to cover everybody or get the people that you think might be able to change? Great question. I say start with who you've got. Um, I think history has shown that um, oftentimes we have to push people where they need to go. Like if we look at just even, I'm, I'm um, just thinking about Mr. Monroe's comments earlier today, um, Inglewood and Teaneck may have predated Brown v. Board, but most of the country did it. You needed Brown v. Board to push the rest of the country to where they needed to be. And I don't, I'm, I'm as a Christian and as a pastor, I still remain hopeful that people can change that people's hearts can be transformed. But I also recognize that we can't wait for people to be transformed. And sometimes it requires legislation. Sometimes it requires um, a policy changes. Sometimes it requires um, demands and we have to wait for people to catch up. Sometimes it takes generations. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, then, um, I believe that um, we're gonna have a few words about the uh, Champions of Peace program. And I just wanna say thank you, uh, Reverend Ponton. That was a 
beautiful and inspirational. And it was, it was truly on point. And it's given us all a whole lot to think about, a lot to chew on, and it's laid out some tasks for us. Thank you. Thank you, Sanito. Uh, we most definitely can do better. Uh, stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the Champions of Peace Awards ceremony on May 9, 2022. Uh, on your screen, you will see the nomination form. Um, I'm going to uh, put one in the chat so you can download it, but also check your emails uh, for uh, this form. Uh, it's very important to us to recognize uh, those among us who uh, champion peace and who in their own way uh, help us to get closer and closer to realizing Dr. King's dream. We still have a long way to go, but we are inching closer and closer every day. So, uh, Think of people in your community. Uh, they cannot be Rotary Club members, but you will nominate them and uh, submit that information to Charlotte Bennett Schoen, uh, charlotte3377 at gmail.com, or contact Kevin or myself or any other member of the committee. Thank you very much. Our final artistic presentation is going to be by Rosie Grant. Rosie Grant serves as a warden for St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Patterson, New Jersey. She's a member of the Rotary Club of Patterson and is the executive director of the Patterson Educational Fund. A community advocate, Rosie was selected as the Rotary Club of Patterson's 2021 Champion of Peace Award. Here to render if I can help somebody, is Miss Rosie Grant. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word.
Our final speaker tonight is going to be Charlotte Ben and Schoen. Ms. Schoen is the chair of this year's Martin Luther King Day and Champions of Peace Committee. She's originally from the city of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia. She's a writ uh, excuse me, she's a longtime resident of Inglewood. Ms. Ben Schoen has been a member of the Inglewood Rotary Club since 2009. Her commitment to the community has included, amongst other efforts, serving on the Inglewood City Council, believing wholeheartedly in service above self, she's committed to the struggle to promote peace. Her efforts have not only been local, but also worldwide, as she's worked to promote community development and the empowerment of the disenfranchised around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Ms. Charlotte Bennett Schoen. Muted? You're good. I see it. Okay, we're good. You have to understand seeing this program tonight and meeting some of the people I've been working with, what a joy and a pleasure it is to work on this project. What you don't know is that it was Donovan's idea not to show an excerpt of Dr. King's speech, but to show all of it, to weave it in to the program, which I know we'll all agree was a whole different dimension. Uh, he also is our technical guru that's here. By the way, he and Kevin, our MCs, are both working attorneys. Um, another person that you didn't see tonight was Sharon Smith. And Donovan, maybe you can pin her while I'm speaking. Sharon and I worked together last year with Champions of Peace and this year, she's a key force. Um, it's Sharon who brought us uh, Reverend Allen. It's Sharon who brought us Rosie. Uh, it's Sharon uh, who had the connections for the kids from the school. And for me, it's just a way of saying working on Champions of Peace, which I believe in, enriches my life. Um, I believe if you want to be the change, I sound like Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, you have to be intentional. You have to work with people who are intentional. But the team this year, the six of us, including Governor John, were able to create a vision that we hope will both inspire. And this Champions of Peace idea, the Rotary is international. And I personally know that I can go 10,000 miles away and walk into a rotary where I don't even speak the language and you're welcomed. And that's a good thing. So I wanna leave you with three things. That the championship, champion of peace program, one, the rotary clubs all get to choose two people. So we have 45, 46 clubs. They will each choose two people in their communities. These clubs have to be intentional. Who do they choose? There's no wrong answers. Last year, we had a 12-year-old. That's awesome. Um, it's necessary. It's required. It's essential. Three, it loops around to this idea of it starts with me, be the change you wish to see in the world. The time is always right to do what's right. All the good elements are in place so that we, instead of looking for someone else to do it, we do it. We meaning the Rotary family reaching out. Uh, there's a saying that Rotary members are already champions so they don't have to be the champion. What I want you to leave with tonight is the idea that we don't necessarily know each other but we know each other now. That Dr. King was international. That Rotary is international. Because our job, our singular job, is to make the world a better place. Rotary's been trying to do that a hundred and some years. I've been trying to do that in my own way for, for a while. If you can leave here tonight and be a little inspired, 
Um, Reverend Sunita, you rocked it. We know each other from way back doing things too. Uh, we got a chance to hear oratory. We had a chance to see a, a revelation spirit. And I guess it's my job to say it wasn't me, it was this committee. We are grateful that you're all here. We're gonna have a Q&A now, but you have my thanks for being part of it. Kevin, Q&A. Are there any questions if, that anyone has about anything? I don't have any questions, Mr. Brown, but I would just like to say thank you to all of those. There wasn't one person that any of us on the committee asked if they would please be supportive that didn't say no. So kudos to Pastor Ponton, Reverend Boyer, um, to Moose. We have we have our a Moose and Patterson too. I don't know if those two Mooses or is it Mises know each other. Right. <laughs> and kudos to the Passaic County Technical Institute for allowing us to share in the blessings of dear students. Just thank you to everyone. And if I may, each and every day, life is very short. So if we could all promise ourselves, we don't have to promise each other, but if we could promise every day that we're blessed to wake up, remember two things. One, we're one day closer to not being here. And the second thing is on that day when we're blessed to wake up, find something good to do to bring joy to someone else, even if it's just a smile. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Sharon. That was beautiful. And I also want to thank Governor Susani for all his support. Um, it's been a pleasure working with everyone here. I don't want to turn this into a love fest, but it truly has <laughs> been a pleasure. And I also want to thank everybody who showed up tonight. Um, yeah. we're, we're doing good things, and we're going to continue to do good things. And uh, Reverend Ponton has given us our, our marching orders. Now it's time for us to get to work. If we're doing something good, let's continue to do it. And at the same time, let's be creative and think about what else we can do. So again, thank you for everyone who came here tonight. I Have just want to, I, I would just love to add um, and say thank you, Charlotte, for uh, making the call. Uh, I was reluctant to join this group because I'm a very busy man, but I can never tell you no. But I'm really glad I didn't say no because um, we've had a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. We laugh a lot. Um, uh, John Suzani is so funny and kind and uh, Rosie and Yasmin and Kevin and just working with you guys. It's been such a pleasure. And, um, and it's also moving because we are a diverse group of people um, and we are here to talk about advancing the cause of black people. I mean, that's the most beautiful thing. Uh, and, and I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I'll play, I've, this is the upcoming president of the Englewood Rotary, Donovan. And then Kevin's the president after him. Awesome. <laughs>